Sunday night at 8 on C-SPAN's Q&A. Our coverage of the election results continues with a forum hosted by the lobbying firm Laszlo Strategies. Later, you'll hear from Democratic pollster Stan Greenberg and Ralph Reed with the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Up first, a panel that includes former White House Communications Director Ann Lewis and Daily Beast contributor Eleanor Clift. This is Two Hours. Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for being here. I'm Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi and I'm founder and president of uh, this organization which is Laszlo Strategies and it's an organization that is uh, does strategic communications but we're not partisan and I'm very very honored and delighted to have a terrific set of panels to offer the audience here today. We have two audiences. We have a live audience here. We're inside the Capitol area. We're in the Rayburn House office building in a hearing room of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'd like to thank Congressman uh, Brad Sherman for providing the room for us. He had a big upset win last night um, over Congressman Berman. I'd like to thank Congressman Berman for his service to America and to congratulate all Congress people who um, ran for office, whether they uh, either won or lost last night. It's an incredible thing to have to serve or to be willing to serve. It's a very painful process to go through negative campaigning, it's very hard on the candidates, very hard on their families. And I think the American voters really owe a debt of gratitude to all who are willing to serve, whether they win or lose. I've picked a very distinguished panel of, of uh, folks to talk today from left to right. To ma try and make it convenient for you, I have seated them in a way that I think is approximately <laughs> from your left to right. So on my right and your left, I'm going to um, start with our first speaker. But the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to very briefly introduce each speaker. Then I'm going to ask them the same question, which is about what happened in the election and what it means. And they'll spend about five minutes. We'll go on to the next speaker. And we're going to have an opportunity to do a lot of Q&A. Uh, this is going to be, again, nonpartisan. Uh, we have both political parties represented, a wide range of views. And so you'll hear the broad spectrum. So I'm going to start with Ann Lewis. Ann Lewis is a real mentor uh, to me. She is a complete superstar in strategic communications. Uh, people know her as former White House communications director under President Bill Clinton and also the shining light behind the political operation of Hillary Clinton. So let me start with Ann Lewis. Thank you. And as to your question, right? Which what is, happened? what happened and what and does it mean for America? I think probably by this hour of the morning, while they're still counting votes in Florida, and may for the next week, I don't really know. I'm sorry, is my mic not on? All right, let's, there's a green, ah, there's an even greener light, I apologize. <laughs> I saw that little green light and I, you know, it was too subtle for me, but I hope we're on now. Here's what we know. We certainly know that the president was reelected. We know that Democrats have picked up seats in the, in the Senate which is contrary to what anybody in Washington, I think, thought even as late as Labor Day, we know the House is going to stay roughly the same. So absent breaking news, I bring you no precinct returns from Florida. I'd like to spend a little more time on why this has happened and, wh and what it then means for us going forward. First, I share the admiration all around for President Obama's campaign team. They were technically close to perfect in the first responsibility of a campaign team, that is to identify and turn out voters. They planned it, they executed it, and at every step of the way, they knew what votes they needed, they went out and got them. They began weeks before election day banking favorable votes in states where they had already had people on the ground pre-planned to produce. So again, technically a superb operation, I think one that will set the standard for future campaigns and how you identify your voters, encourage them to turn out, and perhaps some people will think by the fourth or fifth visit or phone call verging on harassment to turn them out, but it did work. The point I want to make beyond that, however, because I think the technical aspect will get a lot of attention, I want to point out how much of this is actually policy-based. And the fact is elections ultimately are about policies, not just about campaign techniques. The first policy, 
the President Obama, of President Obama's that clearly had a huge impact is the decision to go in there and rescue the American auto industry. That is to use government funds to keep an American industry going. An example of what for Democrats is an ongoing principle that government can be a force for good. Government is not always the enemy. So the rescue of the auto industry, very important, and clearly throughout the Midwest you saw it. The second policy that had direct electoral consequences was his decision to reach out to what we now call the dreamers, young people who had brought, been brought to this country, perhaps by their parents, did not have the appropriate papers for citizenship, but were here, were Americans in every way, and wanted to build a future and they were hoping to go to college. And the President's announcement of an executive decision to suspend deportations for young people in this category was a very strong signal. He shared their hopes, he understood their aspirations, he welcomed them to America. Very important, and as we see in the numbers from the Hispanic community, I think, again, understood and appreciated. The third is a cluster of issues around the question of women's health. While the Affordable Care Act itself may still be unpopular, the provisions around care for women, health care for women, no more gender discrimination in payments, a series of preventive services like cancer screenings, like birth control, are very popular. And so to the extent that Republicans, beginning with their nominee, made it an issue that they were going to roll back these protections, these provisions, they clearly again said to a lot of women, uh, you're, we're not on your side. So again, in each of these, the auto industry hit, reaching out to the dreamers on women's health, you had a symbolic way of saying to people, and a real policy-based way, we understand your lives, we want to be helpful. The fourth piece, I would say, is the issue of marriage. As we said in Maryland, equal marriage. Saying that the rights and responsibilities of marriage should be open to everyone, no matter who they are or who they love. I don't think we fully appreciate yet how important that issue is as a civil rights issue to young voters. So when I look at youth turnout and the heavy margin that President Obama got with young voters, I'd say, again, a smaller cluster of what they see as civil rights issues, making college more affordable, marriage work there. Bottom line, again, it may look to an outsider as if not much has changed. We still have President Obama as president. We still have a Democratic majority in the Senate and a Republican majority in the House. But look at the different people who have now been elected to Congress. Look not just at their faces, but their life experiences. And you will see, I think, a change that truly reflects the changes in America. In the Senate, whoops. In the Senate, we have four new women senators. We had six incumbents, all of whom got reelected. We had five challengers, or five new candidates. Four of the five were reelected. In fact, if I step back and look at this election year as a whole, there were 33 Senate seats up for election. One in three of our Democratic nominees were women. This is a historic marker for our party, and as you can see, the voters liked it too. So four new Democratic women. On the Republican side, for a series of reasons, the number of Republican women in the Senate has actually gone down by one because they had two retirements and only one new candidate. I will continue to watch that, but I think the growing number of women in the Senate, very important, reflected by the way the continuing number of women in the electorate. In 2008, something like 10 million more women than men voted, and they gave President Obama, I believe, a 13-point margin. I cannot say yet this morning what the final turnout will be in the election, but I can tell we can know now that women have given President Obama a 12-point margin. And you get a 12-point margin among the majority of the electorate, uh, you're doing pretty well as a start. So I'd say paying attention to, again, the role of women voters in this one, the role of Hispanic voters, the role of young voters and their enthusiasm for the present, and then go back 
and look at the policies on which it was based and the policies which inspired this turnout, and you have a better sense of what this election means. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to actually turn to the political right instead of going straight to Eleanor uh, to mix it up a bit. I'm going to turn it over to Blaze Hazelwood. Um, Blaze is a real superstar in the Republican Party. Uh, she's the former Republican National Committee political director. She's also the president of Grassroots Targeting, which is a micro-targeting uh, firm. I will also say that her husband, Dan Hazelwood, is one of the leading uh, Republican political consultants also. Both are good friends of mine, um, and she is a working mom. So a uh, real testament to the world of women that this is, I believe, the first panel that I've ever done on politics where we've had so many of the panelists are women and nobody is here for affirmative action. I can assure you this is a superstar panel. So, uh, Blaze, what Thank happened you, Jennifer. on the Republican side? Well, I, my husband and I were talking about this last night, and I just the first thought that occurred to me is this is campaign 101. I mean, that's the bottom line. And um, the the way I look at it is, you know, the first thing that happened is that the Democrats and I got to give the Obama team, you know. Mm great credit is that they turned out their base and they did a fabulous job of it. And there's a lot that we need to learn from them um, as Republicans. Um, the, the next thing is that negative works. We don't like it. Everyone complains about it. But the bottom line is it works. And the Obama team went in and defined uh, Romney early. They spent their money in the summer and they went after him. and. Uh, Romney wasn't given a chance to define himself, and that works. Again, campaign 101. And the last one is you always have to uh, rebut the negatives against you. I mean, it, again, it is um, a, a fundamental part of campaigning. And uh, Romney let the Romney campaign let that summer go unanswered, let all those Bain attacks go unanswered. And um, that was a problem. He was defined. And as you saw on the other side, when we look at the House, uh, they did the exact opposite. Once they knew that they, they were going to be attacked on Medicare, they went on the offensive immediately. And, um, and look where we are. We're pretty much the same place with the House. The House campaigns uh, went negative early. Um, and uh, the results are, you know, very apparent that that again works, um, and so just, you know, for the future, I, I I look at this again as like a learning experience. This is, you know, 2004 all over again. It just the Republicans are the one with the wake up call this time instead of the Democrats. Um, so the sides have changed, and uh, we need to um, we need to look back at this election and, um, you know, again, review our turnout techniques and um, go from there. Thank you, Blaze. I'm going to turn to Eleanor Clift. Eleanor is a distinguished writer. She's published many books. Uh, she's a contributor to Newsweek magazine and Daily Beast website and a regular panelist on the syndicated talk show, The McLaughlin Group. Eleanor, what happened from your perspective and what does it mean for America? Well, first of all, my chair is lower than the two ladies on my right, right. and left. That is true. But uh, from my political perspective, I'm 10 feet tall today, so I can handle it. It's really funny. Uh, um, it was a good night for Democrats, for women, for pot smokers, uh, for, <laughs> for the new emerging electorate. And uh, this was not your grandfather's electorate. Ronald Reagan ran in a very different America. Uh, Ronald Reagan would probably have a difficult time in today's uh, Republican primary uh, process. And uh, I think there are lessons here on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, but I think they're not as technocratic as, uh, as Blaze is suggesting. I mean, I think those lessons can be learned pretty easily. It's the, the, the remaking of uh, a party's approach. If uh, the Republicans can't be a national party if they uh, turn off African Americans, Hispanics, and now women. And uh, the Republican Party today is 90% white, uh, and uh, the Democratic party, I understand that the caucus that returns to Washington will be 50 percent uh, majority, will, will be 50 percent or I guess majority, minority, and, and women. And when we look at the State of the Union, 
uh, next year. That divide is so apparent with uh, Republicans on one side, the Democrats on the other, and the overwhelming white maleness of the Republican Party comes through. And they're, you know, I love white males. I gave birth to three of them. But there aren't <laughs> enough of them to keep the Republican Party uh, alive. And I, I should add as a footnote, my three sons aren't contributing to the Republican <laughs> Party either. So, um, so there are lessons here. I think the Republican Party is going to have to go through some uh, rethinking. Uh, and there were lessons here for President Obama as well. He had a near-death experience after the first debate. I think he did see his pol political mortality. And uh, if there was any, I think a, a word that I hear from my Republican friends, sort of fecklessness to the Obama presidency, that he's, you know, this celebrity and he can coast, I think uh, that has been purged from him. And I think he understands, I mean, he won because, in large part because of the auto bailout, which was a courageous decision. I think um, opposition to it was overwhelming, even within the Democratic Party. He did it. It succeeded. It was bold. It was clear. We need more of those kinds of decisions and more of that uh, leadership. And I think he needs to um, be mindful that he has to tell his story along the way. However superb this campaign was, the White House team was terrible at message making during most of his presidency. They lost control of the health care debate. Uh, the Tea Party came in and filled that void. And uh, the, that cost them the House in 2010. And it's going to probably be a long time before they get the House back because of redistricting and, 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 and all of that. And that's the one um, sour note for Democrats coming out of uh, the election is uh, what to do about the House, and um, is, is there a way back to, to the, the majority? So there's going to be some probably rethinking of their uh, approach and, and, their, and their leadership. So um, I would like to see the president um, name Governor Romney to some kind of post, you know, um, uh, the bully pulpit for business America, uh, bol bolstering business. Uh, I think it would be it would send the right message, and I thought Governor Romney's concession spe speech last night was really classy, and um, I think that's probably who he is. Uh, but he doesn't run alone; he runs with a party, and I think um, he alone could not change his party, even if he got elected. And so I, I think I would like to see Governor Romney have some sort of prominent role. I know there's bad blood between these two men, but there's a lot of gamesmanship in politics, too. And if you're the winner, you can afford to be generous. And uh, uh, President-elect um, Obama reached out to Hillary Clinton after a very bitter primary fight. And look at all the good that's come from that. So that's my, uh, my wish for the future. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. I'm going to turn to Rick Dunham, who's one of Washington's most uh, seasoned and insightful uh, political reporters. He uh, covers politics for Hearst, and he's also president of the board at the National Press Club uh, Journalism Institute and is a past president of the National Press Club. Uh, Rick Dunham. Great. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. I, I've attended a lot of Jennifer's I've attended a lot of Jennifer's sessions over the years covering them, so it is a special honor to be on the panel. I hope I can uh, impart en enough wisdom here to make it worth it having me up here. Uh, in my uh, new life as uh, a web writer, uh, since all journalists are multimedia all the time, uh, um, I like to do top ten lists, and, and because we have five minutes, I'm just going to do top six takeaways from the election last night uh, for me. Number one, and it was the lead of my uh, analysis that ran in Hearst Papers from Albany to San Francisco, that there truly is a demographic tidal wave and the Republicans ignore it at their own peril. Uh, in the past four decades, the percentage of minority voters in the electorate has gone from 9% to 28%. Uh, if you had the same electorate uh, as, uh, as, as we had uh, in 2000, Romney would have won yesterday. The same way four years ago, if we had had the electorate of 1988, John McCain would have defeated Barack Obama. So the facts are there. If people turn out, if, if minority voters turn out, uh, the Republicans have a, uh, a 
disadvantage to start with. Latino vote, it was just huge. You look at the states, you look at Florida, you look at Colorado, you look at Nevada, uh, you could even argue Iowa, uh, but state after state, the Latino vote, if you take it out, the Democrats would have lost. Even in Florida, it was 61-39, that includes the Cubans. Uh, Cuban Americans are not no longer the majority uh, in Florida among uh, Latinos, but also the younger generation of Cuban Americans is voting like uh, Puerto Rican or Dominican Latinos. They're not voting like the anti-Castro parents and grandparents. Asian Americans, that was the biggest shift, 75-25 for Obama. And I remember covering the 2000 race, Gore and Bush. I think Bush actually won the uh, Asian American vote. Uh, before September 11th, uh, Asian American vote was a swing vote leaning Republican. Yesterday it was three to one Democratic. Urban rural, uh, it's, uh, it, it, they're mirror images, the, and it's, it's roughly 60-40. Uh, and demographically, which areas are growing? Are the urban areas or rural America? You wouldn't want to bet on uh, rural America uh, to be your population center going ahead. Um, young and old, uh, it's, uh, again, the, um, the, the youngest voters are the most pro-Obama, although I will say that the 18 to 21 voters are less pro-Obama, were less pro-Obama than the people slightly older than they are, the, the 20, 21 to 30. But still, which would you rather have? Young voters who are going to be voters for 60, 70 years, or... Uh, the people who were 21 when Ronald Reagan was elected, who are today's seniors. Again, think of the generation. The seniors of today are not the greatest generation. They're not the uh, they're, they're they're not the New Deal uh, Roosevelt Republic. I mean Roosevelt Democrats. Uh, and the people who are going to be tomorrow seniors are people like me. And we are not your uh, we are not the same kind of demographic. As, uh, as the greatest generation. Um, gender gap, Republicans can't be the party just of older white men, uh, and, uh, and it, really is, it really is important. Uh, two years ago, the, the Republicans did quite well among women across the board, uh, but uh, yesterday you saw the gender gap among women stayed roughly the same as four years ago although men opened up, and, and Romney did a lot better among men than, uh, than McCain did. Uh, finally, born again uh, and evangelical Protestants, uh, it, if you look in Virginia, that, that could have been the difference all alone. The percentage of the, popu of the voting population that was evangelical, born again Protestant, went down significantly over four years. And uh, in a lot of states, you're going to have to look, as North Carolina has more and more people who are not the old Jesse Helms, born-again evangelical Protestants, South Carolina, Georgia, you may see demographic changes there that could make those states more competitive going ahead. Okay, I'll be quick on, on the other takeaways. Number two, the polls were right. Uh, there was a lot of debate about were the polls biased and, and legitimate debate about the methodologies, the screens for likely voters, and do we get it right in this era where a lot of people uh, use cell phones? And, and not landlines as their primary means of communication. Well, I'll say this, uh, this the, it's, polling is an art and science, and they really did a very good job, by and large, almost every leading polling organization. Gallup was probably the outlier, but they were still within the margin of error. So um, I think that's a, that's a big takeaway. Number three, I think there's a myth of the undecided voter. I think that all year, all year long, we had stories. Who are the undecided voters? Well, it was people who were parking themselves going one direction or another. And depending which week it was, your, your definition of who is an undecided voter changed. Before that first debate, the undecided voters were people who, who uh, I mean, because Obama was ahead in the polls, so the people who said they were undecided were people who were st still dissatisfied with, uh, with the economy, with Obama's performance, but they weren't yet sold on Romney. So we were saying, that was the undecided voter. Well, a week later, those people were saying they were for Romney, and the people who were undecided were people who used to be for Obama, but they didn't like his performance in the debate, and so they were undecided. I think it's just a myth of saying who is undecided. I think if we're going to analyze it, we have to analyze it as persuadable voters, as who it is 
who's not in the core of either party who could be persuaded. I just think the way we, as reporters, analyze undecided voters is ridiculous. Number four, uh, independents are no longer the swing group. I mean, it, it, you look, Romney won independents, and in a lot of key battleground states, he carried the independent vote and lost. Uh, I think independents, the way they define themselves now in this era of very strong partisanship, tend to lean slightly Republican. If, if they split even or if Democrats win it, it's a very good year for Democrats. It's the mirror image of moderates. Moderates lean Democratic, but moderates are also a key swing vote. To me, you have to look at people who call themselves moderates, call themselves independents, and somewhere in between there or the combination of the two of them is your swing electorate. But I think we had dismissed moderates for years because people were saying, well, that group leans Democratic. Well, we should dismiss independents then because that group leans Republican. I think it's a combination of the two that we have to analyze going forward. Uh, number five is the suburbs can't be analyzed as a whole. You look, I mean, nationally, Romney won the suburbs by two points. But look at Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia delivered Virginia for Obama. The blue state suburbs, Philadelphia just wiped out Romney. I mean, the city of Philadelphia did, but the suburbs also wiped out Romney. New York, Philadelphia, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, the suburbs all very Democratic. They were swing, the suburbs were swing in Denver, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. And the suburbs of Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Atlanta, Charlotte, and in South Carolina were very Republican. So I think calling suburb, analyzing by saying suburbs uh, doesn't work. You have to look at, at each individual suburb or the region of the country. And finally, uh, number six, we have to rethink the way uh, we spend money in politics. I mean, this was a $6 billion election year with status quo results. I think the biggest success when it comes to money in politics, and I'm not talking about message, but just macro, is that Karl Rove separated billionaires from billions of their dollars. <laughs> to what effect? Um, <laughs> I mean, more, I mean, it may be more effective way maybe just to pay voters directly. I mean, there's probably more, <laughs> more return for your investment. And I would conclude by saying that probably the Supreme Court of the United States is the second most important institution in the United States in aiding the economic recovery. Because next to the Fed, they have done more money, more to pump more money, more stimulus into the economy in hard hit states like Nevada, Nevada Florida, Ohio, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and uh, Cal California than any institution. They may even be more important than the Fed. So uh, again, I think we have to look at, at uh, money and politics. As Blaze said, what's effective? As I say, what wasn't effective at changing a lot of opinions. This was very interesting, uh, the comments from all four speakers. I want to ask about a particular demographic group that none of you touched on, despite uh, the consistent theme I heard of, of demography really um, being impactful in America. One out of every five Americans has a disability. Um, and 51% of likely voters said they have a family member mm -hmm. with a disability. Uh, yet at the National Press Club, when there was a, an opportunity for, as you know, as the past president of the Press Club, for both the Romney campaign and the Obama campaign to send someone to speak about disability um, issues, the Romney campaign chose not to attend and chose not to issue a position paper on disabilities. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, why, given that one out of every five Americans has a disability, and 51% of American likely voters has a family member, loved one with a disability, why isn't there more of a conversation about that demographic within our society and our election process? Well, I think the short answer is in an in, in a uh, election that's revolving around the role of government, um, if you're for small government, why would you want to get into a conversation about how do you assist um, people with disabilities? Because it implies that there's a role for government which might mean a program, which might mean money. And so I think it's just not a conversation they'd want to engage in right before an election. Yeah. I'm going to step back a bit and say I think it becomes part of a mix of issues around caregiving that are, in fact, directly important to women who are usually the caregivers whether of children or of the older members of the family, this falls to the women. 
And so they see it in, as part of their role as caregivers. Less, again, I'd say disability is an issue than about how do we care for one another and how do I meet my responsibilities, whether as a mother or as a daughter, you know, as an aunt. And when you talk to voters about their roles as caregivers, whether it is the Family and Medical Leave Act, for example, which was one of the big successes, early successes of the Clinton administration, or the new rules in the Affordable Care Act, which say, for example, no, insurance companies cannot cap the amount of money that goes to someone because of illness. If you listen to President Obama talk about the family whose daughter had leukemia, and because of the Affordable Care Act, they would now continue to get support for their child where otherwise it was about to run out. Disability gets woven in to a set of issues that, as Eleanor says, you could also describe as the role of government, but I think a more human way to say it is, again, how do we help one another meet those responsibilities? Okay. I, mean, I, I think it's an opportunity for Republicans. It's an opportunity that was lost this year. I, mean, I think back to George Bush in 2000 uh, and his, the way he tried to define himself as a different kind of Republican, and one of the ways was on education, and he talked about the soft bigotry of low expectations. I, mean, I think a Republican who, who would deal with this directly would try to figure out a, the role of government that could be helpful, uh, and, and, and also to talk about the private sector and the, and the, uh, and, and, and the imperative for all Americans uh, to get together, uh, whether government's involved or not would be a plus, but I just don't think it was part of the, uh, the, think, the thinking this year. I, I think that Eleanor uh, hit the nail on the head for why the Republicans didn't talk about it. Blaze, given the wounded warriors uh, issues and other issues, uh, do you agree uh, with Anne that Republicans don't have what to say on disability issues? When I think of disability advocates, I think of uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, I think of Pete Sessions, I think of Tom Ridge, I think of the fact that the ADA was, pre was passed by a Republican administration. Um, is there a reason that there wasn't more done to target that constituency? Well, I'll just go back to Campaign 101 again. You have to talk to people. I mean, the fact that they didn't show up is a problem. Um, and that goes to the other demographics that we were talking about. Uh, former President Bush talked to Hispanics. Uh, we didn't see that, again, in this campaign. So, I, it, again, I just want to go back to that just simple statement. But I'd also like to take an, another step back. I'm not sure I agree completely that this is all about demographics, and I know I'm in the minority on this uh, panel, but I, I think about the 49% nation. Uh, I mean, that's where we were in 2004, and everyone who said that this is another 2004 election, well, it is. And I remember uh, walking around with uh, uh, a PowerPoint in encouraging people to turn out, and it the first page of the PowerPoint was the 49% nation, and um, I, I I see that we're we're in it, and you know after every election, um, you know every four years it's you know the demise of you know whatever political party lost, and you know they're going to have to redefine themselves, and. Um, I, again, I just simply see it as 49%. So we're going to take questions from the audience, but this is how it's going to work. If you want to ask a question, I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone. It works a lot better for C-SPAN if people can actually hear what you're asking. So if you have a question, just please make your way to the microphone. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear uh, what it is that's on your mind. Um, I'm going to ask that it be a question and not a statement so that uh, we can be um, answering questions up here and not hearing um, political views and that you identify your yourself uh, when you come up. Um, so as people are making their way up to ask questions, I'd like to ask a question about the future because we really talked about what happened in the election, but we really haven't hit on what does it mean? Uh, Anne touched on it in that, uh, as did others, $6 billion was spent and a lot of time and energy and talent was spent on this campaign. There were voters across America that took as much as six hours to stand in line to vote. And at the end of this, we have have the same president, the same House Majority Leader, and the same Senate Leader. So what is that going to mean in terms of policy as it moves forward here in Washington? 
I'm going to go back again. Then I would say, as I ended, the fact that we have the same majority leader, for example, in the Senate, and I'm very glad we do, and Harry Reid is a great leader, but the fact that he is still the majority leader doesn't mean there hasn't been a change. There has, in fact, been a significant change in the makeup of who people are. And as I say, it's about their life experiences. It's about what they bring to the table. The fact is, in the state of New Hampshire, for example, we now have a woman governor, Maggie Hassan. We have two women senators, one Democrat and one Republican. And we now have two women Democratic members of Congress. Well, New Hampshire is a pioneer in our politics in many ways. Uh, we all know that Dixville Notch cast the first mm -hmm. votes. And it may be that they're going to be a pioneer in this kind of representation. I want to go back for a moment, by the way, Jennifer. You talked about disability. And as we were thinking about this, I realized when I hear Maggie Hassan talk about why she got interested in politics and what it meant for her, it starts with her having a disabled child. So when we do hear talk specifically about disability, in my experience, it is often by candidates or leaders who bring to the table, this is about my family. And then they build on that and say, now what can we do for everyone else? Well, I, I would just add that um, given the state of the economy, the expectation early on was that Mitt Romney uh, should win, would win and that he would bring with him a Republican Senate. We would have a unified uh, one control, one party control uh, government. And so the fact that the Democrats beat that back uh, against a lot of uh, opinionizing that for a long time suggested that's what would happen. And the, the Republican Senate was taken for granted up until just uh, maybe two months ago when, it, it, when some of the Republican candidates began to say things that uh, put them outside of the mainstream, I guess, is the kind way to, to put it. And the Democrats had some very good candidates. And so um, those races were just decided kind of uh, individually. So I, while I agree the numbers are status quo, I, I think the ethos in Washington is, is very different, that a, um, a rising Republican tide was turned back. Uh, Democrats are more f firmly uh, in control, and uh, lessons have been learned from the first uh, four years. Uh, maybe no more Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> so can you expand on that into the fiscal cliff and some of the yep. policies that well, are moving? I think I, mean, I want to look ahead to the future. I don't have a good, clear crystal ball here because I think it's all things that are still to be determined. Number one, Barack Obama, does he reach out to Republicans, starting with Mitt Romney, but really the leadership and some of the key players who he might be able to work with in a bipartisan way, say John McCain, uh, as well as, as, I mean, there are House members, there are senators. Does he reach out? Uh, secondly, legislation, does he govern from the center out or does he govern from the base over to try to get a majority? On the Republican side, uh, how do they respond if, if Obama reaches out? I, I strongly believe that he will reach out, that he does realize that with a fiscal cliff facing us, uh, that he has to do something. How do the Republicans respond? Uh, how does Mitch McConnell respond? Uh, I, mean, I think the Senate could easily come up with a deal with the White House. The question is, then, what happens in the House? And there are two questions with John Boehner. Number one, is he temperamentally willing to go and legislate, especially if he gets major concessions from the president? I think in my gut the answer is yes. That leads to the second question. Can he bring his caucus along? Yes, a couple of the leading Tea Party members of the House Republican majority were defeated, but that caucus is still as conservative as it was before last night. So I don't know the answer, but we have, some, we have issues that could really divide us. Immigration, where the president is going to move ahead very quickly. Um, I say the 10 to 1 deal that every Republican presidential candidate said that they would not accept. It may not be 10 to 1. It may be 4 to 1 or 5 to 1. But it's going to be a deal where Republicans get at least 80 percent of what they want. The question is, can they say yes to 80 percent of what they want? I mean, I, and, and the final one is the Supreme Court, especially what happens if uh, Antonin Scalia or Anthony Kennedy retire. You know, forget Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, and let's just, let's just see what happens, even if there's a, quote, mainstream nominee, 
Or uh, what if uh, President Obama names the first Asian American justice to the Supreme Court? Uh, what, what, what will the Republicans do in that case? So I, I, I wish I could give you the answers. I think that we will see more bipartisanship, but I think we're going to see a lot of bloodletting also. Blaze? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen because I don't think that Obama, President Obama told us what he plans to do. And I'm very curious what he plans to do. Uh, you know, he told us that he's not Mitt Romney, but he did not give us what he's going to do with the budget in the coming years. So I, I don't know. I have to ask Well, him. isn't there a blueprint for what he tried to do with John Boehner? And isn't there a blueprint in how, what his policies of the of these years that he has to consolidate them. I mean, I, I, I just I just don't buy the notion that we have no idea what he's going to do. I think we have a pretty good idea. He didn't tell us. Well, what would you like him to say and how many Well, I'd like him to tell us what he plans to do with the budget and how we're going to deal with the fiscal cl cliff and Okay, what. well, I think now we're in that period. Mm -hmm. Now we'll see. Okay. How he yeah, does we'll that. I don't think Mitt Romney told us how he would deal with that either. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right on that. Right. <laughs> we can agree on that. Well, right. yeah, and, and the model here is, to me is health care reform, where Barack Obama never told us exactly what he wanted. He didn't do what Bill Clinton did and put a proposal on the table. And I think that that's, that's what we're going to see. Does the president put out an immigration proposal? Does he embrace Simpson Bowles or some, some variant of that? Or does he just try to bring everybody into the White House a bipartisan leadership and come up with something behind closed doors that can pass. We don't know the answer. I mean, this is where Blaze is right. We don't know the answer, which will be the approach of the president. Either one could work. Either one has risks. Uh, the first one has more risks to the president if he puts out plans that the Republicans can knock down. The second is more dangerous for the Republican leadership if they cut a deal and they can't bring their followers along. Uh, so I, 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 either way is fine with me. It'll be great for reporters. Right. <laughs> First question. Uh, two issues, two questions. One, uh, are you surprised that the issue of Mormonism uh, played such a small part in the campaign, apparent, apparently? And secondly, is not one conclusion that the Republican Party might draw that uh, they need someone who is a standard bearer who is more publicly determined and committed to the precise base issues uh, and will be more strongly committed in such a way as not to, to move uh, and shift positions during the course of the campaign. Blaze, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, I, you know, again, go back to, uh, you know, this being a 49% nation. I mean, I, I think that, um, that the you know the issues um, whether you know how strongly they were um, talked about is you know another issue um, but um, i i don't I don't necessarily think that um, th that again made a difference you know how you know how conservative or um, you know how liberal uh, because the you know the base on each side is is what it is um, in terms of not um, talking about the uh, you know religion um, you know I give the uh, I give the Democrats and the the um, the, the Democrat Party um, credit because they didn't they didn't use that in the campaign um, and it's something that they could have done. And I also give the Romney campaign credit and, and Romney himself for addressing um, you know, his religion um, early on. And it just goes back to, again, campaign 101, you know, be you know, you rebut.